Please welcome Professor Richardson today. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to Fred Gould for the uh, wonderful day of talks. I'm just honored to be a part of this. My hope is uh, to help answer this question that Fred Gould posed to me. Could you please talk on how culture influences choices by genetic researchers? Um, and the way I'm going to go about this is uh, it's not useful to talk in generalities. Let's talk about a specific subset of research. And in my work, I've looked a lot at how gender ideologies, conceptions, assumptions, tra traditional ideas around maleness and femaleness have played a role in the history of scientific knowledge around human sex, sexuality, and gender. So I'm going to ask the question this way. Let's look at a case study. How do cultural assumptions about gender influence scientific research? And to kick us off, what I'd like to do is start with a video by uh, the very prominent geneticist David Page. He's a Y chromosome expert. The Y chromosome, of course, is uh, generally exclusive to males. Um, and he has led the, proje uh, the project to sequence and understand the Y chromosome over the last 20 years or so. He was, for some time, the director of the Elite Whitehead Institute at MIT, so a leading researcher in the field. And here is a, you know, TED Talks. Here is a TED-type talk that he gave earlier this year, just a short clip from it. That our genomes are all 99.9% .9 identical from one person to the next. This idea that we're 99.9% .9 identical has gained great traction, and for a number of reasons. It's very appealing to say that we're all 99.9% .9 identical. It's so appealing that this idea was seized upon by President Bill Clinton in his 2000 State of the Union address. When he stated that this fall at the White House, we had a distinguished scientist visiting, an expert in this work on the human genome, and he said that we are all, regardless of race, genetically 99.9% .9 the same. Well, it turns out that this idea is even correct. As long as the two individuals being compared are both men. It's also correct if the two individuals being compared are both women. However, if you compare the genome of a man with the genome of a woman, you'll find that they are actually only 98.5%. In other words, the genetic difference between a man and a woman is 15 times the genetic difference between two men or between two women. Let us consider, for example, the case of Bill and Hillary. <laughs> so it turns out that Bill is as genetically similar to Hillary as he is to a male chimpanzee. <laughs> but the human genome, we have a problem. In the human genome era in which we're living, this difference, this fundamental difference between males and females has been overlooked. Instead, we have been operating with a unisex vision of the human genome. And so, in fact, men and women are not equal in their genomes, as I've just explained. OK, we'll leave it at there. Let me begin by locating myself in an area of inquiry, now about three decades old, um, of feminist investigations of the relationship between science, scientific knowledge, scientific institutions, um, and the sex gender system. Um, and what I'm interested in doing is situated, located, accountable knowledge that matters about emerging research in the human genome sciences. And when I see claims like David Page's, um, I see an opportunity for provocative engagement between science studies and gender studies scholars and the emerging science in human genome research. This is both 
an ethical engagement, and what we might call an epistemic engagement at the level of theory and evidence in this field. Now, broadly speaking, there's a big debate going on in research on human sex differences. The, dom the model that has dominated for a long time could be described as a binary and essentialist model. It's very, very much reflected in uh, Dr. Page's comments uh, that suggest that males and females are so different that they're as different or more different than two different species. Um, the notion is that males and females don't even share the same genome, but like two different species, have different genomes, that there's a male genome and a female genome. The contrasting uh, framework or model, and of course I'm generalizing wildly here, um, emphasizes more the overlap between males and females, the context in which sex and gender differences are produced through lived experiences and in particular cultures, and the incredible variation that we see in sex and gender variation uh, uh, expression in the world. Um, in my area of inquiry, there's been lots and lots and lots of good work showing how cultural conceptions of gender can enter into the science at the point of starting science from the assumption of a sex binary, as in ideas about pink brains and blue brains, or estrogen and testosterone as the foundation of femaleness and maleness. Then you take that assumption, and as you do your research, you neglect variation within each sex, or you understate the overlap in characteristics between the sexes, leading to findings that overstate and exaggerate differences between males and females, and then circulate back into binary stereotypes about males and females, uh, such as the idea that women are emotional and men are aggressive, and circulate back into the science in this way. So the practice that, I that we might describe my field is doing is gender analysis of science. That means work to make visible the operation of gender in science in its language, its visual representation, its theories, models, and its practices. Now you might be saying, how could this be? How can gender play such a role in scientific knowledge? And if it is, isn't that a rare aberration that represents a terrible abuse of science? Well, it would be so if this is your picture of how scientific knowledge is produced. That is, that you have a hypothesis, you go and find some evidence for your hypothesis, and you chunk out a scientific fact. But actually, I want to introduce you, by way of thinking about how, how cultural ideas influence scientific knowledge, to a totally different way of thinking about scientific knowledge production. One in which science is actually a practice of making inferences under conditions of uncertainty. That is what we philosophers call underdetermination. So according to the underdeterminationist hypothesis, science is not produced as a simple in and out equation of facts, uh, of evidence leading to facts, but instead scientific findings are underdetermined by the evidence, meaning there's a gap between evidence and theory. And this gap is filled by background assumptions. They might be assumptions we borrow from the consilience of a particular idea with other ideas and mechanisms in science. Some of these background assumptions are explicit. We can see them. We list them in our hypothesis making. And others can be implicit. They can be invisible even to the researcher and to the broader research community, especially when they reflect dominant ideas in society that are often uncriticized. So this is a little hard to read probably for those of you in the back, but just uh, by way of a little thumbnail sketch, the underdeterminationist view is richer in the variety of things that go into scientific reasoning. So you start actually with a set of assumptions you, and hypotheses. You do gather data, and then you have to do this very human work of interpreting that data. And what do you get at the end? Not something rightly described as a scientific fact, but a new hypothesis for broader testing and consideration. This picture of science I would call science as social knowledge. That is, science is produced through the intersubjective processes through which communities of knowers evaluate knowledge. So we, we can expand this rich picture of how science is scientific knowledge is produced to include lots of steps 
that are each entry points for, for cultural assumptions into scientific reasoning. From the moment of uh, formulation of a research question to disciplinary training, funding, local hypotheses, gathering of data and the kinds of samples that we use, statistical analysis, the assumptions that go into that, the representation of the data, where are your error bars, the naming of that data, what terms are we using, and how do they condition our reasoning. Um, and I won't read all of them, but all the way up through the circulation of ideas beyond the research community, and also peer review, tenure, promotion, all of these aspects of science as a profession and a career. So this flowchart illustrates just examples of the many points in scientific knowledge production, which is a social practice at which cultural assumptions can enter in to scientific reasoning as grounded background assumptions for uh, formulating scientific hypotheses. Uh, a way to describe this, these kinds of, the, the kinds of values that I'm talking about, gender assumptions, um, is contextual values. So we're thinking about values from the context of scientific research that may reflect our deeply held gender ideologies, our beliefs that arise from our daily interactions in the world um, and our political and ideological values as well about just what male and female are or should be in the world. I mentioned the larger receptive popular context as one example of how uh, these contextual values can percolate into and around science. So there's certainly a very strong popular dimension to our discussions around science, and we value this because we want there to be a big, broad, democratic conversation about science. Um, but the popularization of science can provide a vehicle through which uh, broader ideas in the culture uh, are not only reinforced by science, but circle back into the science as there is a cathectic relationship between popular reception and the kinds of co questions that are valued within science and the kinds of possibilities and constraints on possibilities for interpreting and desc describing scientific results. So when I say popular science, I might mean something like sex difference claims situated in a much broader field that includes includes all variety of scientific texts, high school curricula, the science sections of newspapers and magazines, our favorite best-selling authors, popular men's and women's magazine, Maxim and Cosmo have a lot to tell you about our uh, lay ideas about maleness and femaleness, even TV nature shows with their depictions of uh, male and female behavior in the non-human animal kingdom. So let's get a little bit more rigorous here. I'm, I'm arguing that contextual values can influence scientific reasoning at several points. They can influence it at the level of practices that bear on the epistemic integrity of science. They can determine which questions are asked and ignored about a given phenomenon. They can affect the description of data. And also, they, they can add, that is, value-laden terms in the description of experimental or observational data. And values may even uh, influence the selection of data or the kinds of phenomena to be investigated. Specific and global assumptions, contextual values can be expressed in or motivate the background assumptions, facilitating inferences in a very specific area of inquiry, like I'm going to show you today, or in a broad field of in inquiry. They can determine, that is, the character of research in an entire field. OK, so with a very limited time to speak with you today, I'm just going to offer one case study from my recent book, Sex Itself, The Search for Male and Female in the Human Genome. Now, in that work, I track the emergence in the 20th century of a new and distinctive way of thinking about sex. Um, it's remarkable to imagine that it was just a little over 100 years ago that the X and Y chromosomes were even discovered. And they represented from their inception the, an idea of an unalterable binary, a simple, visually compelling binary, um, right at the base of theories of sex and gender. And I look at the interaction between cultural gender norms and theories in genetic uh, work on sex 
from the beginning of the 20th century all the way to the present post-genomic age. Now, I analyzed the history of human sex chromosomes as gendered objects of scientific knowledge. Uh, for example, I look at how the X came to be thought of as the female chromosome, even though both males and females have a X chromosome. And in fact, the X chromosome arguably has greater consequences for men's health than it does for women's health um, due to the phenomenon of sex linkage. Okay. I show how the X and Y emerged from a raucous century of changes in our conceptions of sex differences and gender roles as really the basis of a hierarchy of conceptual layers of sex and gender that kind of moves from hard to soft. So chromosomal sex becomes the hard end of the spectrum, leading into hormonal, gonadal, morphological sex, and finally gender presentation and sexual orientation. So by way of a case study from this book, I want to look more closely at this claim that has circulated well beyond David Page um, within the field of sex chromosome research. This curious claim that human males and females differ by this uh, Hunt Willard at Duke says 2% quote, greater than the hereditary gap between humankind and its closest relative, the chimpanzee. So this has come up again and again. Um, there is, he argues, quote, not one human genome, but actually two, a male and a female genome. Now, this quote was occasioned by the publication of a 2005 article by Willard's lab, in which Willard and co-author Carroll um, promoted a finding about the X chromosome as showing that male Males and females, like different species, have different genomes, and that contrary to the politically correct vision of a shared universal human genome, males and females are more genetically different than had ever been conceived, and kind of suggesting that genetics holds the key to these deep differences between males and females. Uh, other quotations at the time, the 2005 was when the full sequence of the human X chromosome was first released. Mark Ross at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Cambridge actually ran that sequencing effort. And on that occasion, he stated that now that we've got the sequence of both sex chromosomes, the X and the Y, we can do a very detailed comparison to really ask the differences between males and females. So sex chromosome geneticists have begun presenting analysis of the X and Y as, it, as offering kind of at last the real story, the final word on human sex differences. Now, there are many reasons to be concerned about this emerging conception of genomic sex differences. Um, and I'm going to have to, I, I do think that there's a highly provocative nature of this human chimp claim, which has a deep racial and gendered history in the history of science. But for now, I want to briefly look at this as a case study of how gendered assumptions can enter into the local and global reasoning of a set of scientific claims. Because what this claim does is it embraces a binary picture of sex differences as a starting assumption. And it conditions and pulls all of its reasoning about evidence toward that model without adequately considering perfectly legitimate and equally explanatory, if not more explanatory, alternative models. OK, so in this brief case study, um, and I have, it's well treated in my book and also a paper um, in, that's titled something like, Are Males and Females as Different as Humans and Chimpanzees? Um, the, I, I want to present a detailed, a somewhat detailed empirical critique of these claims. Um, and my point is that there are assumptions made at each stage that systematically overstate the ledger of the number of differences in the genome between males and females. Let me back up quickly because there may be some in the audience who are saying, what's a chromosome? Chromosomes, of course, are the tightly coiled bundles of DNA. Humans have 23 pairs of them. 22 of those are known as the autosomes. And the, third, the 23rd pair is known as the uh, sex chromosomes. Uh, XY typically in males, XX typically in females. As you'll notice, the Y is represented as much smaller than the X chromosome. It is about 1 20th the content of the, y, of the X chromosome in uh, the amount of DNA or genes uh, present on, rather on the Y chromosome. Okay, and let me just briefly review the 
typical classical picture of the role of the sex chromosomes in generating human phenotypic sex differences. This model, by the way, as I show in my book, is being radically redrawn at this very moment as our genomic picture of sex um, is elaborated uh, with whole genome analysis. But suffice it to say that in order to produce fertile uh, male or female phenotypic sex in humans, uh, the X and Y chromosome are not sufficient. They are part of a broader pathway. And in fact, what's really crucial is the presence or absence of a gene called SRY um, on the Y chromosome. Uh, and, but in addition to having that apparatus at the genetic stage, you then have to have the right ratio of gonadal hormones, androgens to estrogens, produced by your gonads in order to uh, complete the production of phenotypic sex. Okay, so let's look at Willard and Carroll's claim. Willard and Carroll, in 2005, suggested that analysis of the human X chromosome showed that there were a number of genes on the X chromosome in females. Just go with me here, I know this is getting a little complex, that escape from inactivation. So how is it that males and females aren't wildly different? It's because the second X chromosome in females it is inactivated very early in development, so that functionally both males and females are monosomic for the X chromosome. They both have one functional X chromosome in each cell. The provocative finding that Willard offered in 2005 is that actually on that second X chromosome in females, some genes escape from this inactivation. And so they suggested that these X escapee genes represent a long ignored piece in the causal picture of sexual dimorphism. And hence their claim that you know, the differences are greater than we ever thought. So they suggested that they argued that between 15 and 25% of the genes on the inactivated female X chromosome escape inactivation. So they argued that females actually are running around with twice the dosage of about 200 to 300 genes on the X chromosome. And these genes, they argued explicitly in their paper, may in large part specify sex differences. So the much hyped estimate of one to two percent difference between males and females arose directly from this picture of genetic differences that they drove their interpretation for. So I would say here's their argument. They say, okay, first of all, men have the Y chromosome and let's say there are about 50 genes on the Y chromosome that men just have and, and women don't have. And then we've found these 200 to 300 genes on the second X chromosome in females that express more, maybe they're, let's say they're doubled in, in dosage in females. And so we get 250 to 350 genes, they argued, that differ between human males and females. And if you do the math, assuming about 20 to 30,000 human genes, then you get this number. Males and females differ by one to 2% of the coding genome. Now, there are, there are a, a range of approaches to this kind of quantitative claim, right? Uh, we've all seen the t-shirts, I am 75% banana, right? These quantitative claims can be extremely spurious, right, in the first place. And there are all sorts of levels of relevant similarity and comparison. I'm going to just not put that aside for now. If you want the details, you can read the paper. But I just want to show you in a simple way how assumptions systematically skewed their results to favor a finding of dramatic sex differences. OK, what about 50 male-specific genes? Well, what do we know about the Y chromosome? Actually, not all of the genes on the Y chromosome are unique to males. Actually, only a few are. The X and Y chromosome are homologs. They evolved from each other. And a lot of the extant content on that small little Y chromosome is the same as gene content on the X chromosome. So it's not that all the genes on the Y chromosome are unique to males. Instead, there's a region of the Y chromosome that is male specific. So here are the shared genes between the X and the Y. They diverged from one another and have many genes in common. So actually what you have to do is uh, subtract out those that are shared with the X, about 29, 
there are 25 outside of this region that uh, are not in the shared reason, region with the X, but because of their evolutionary history, do remain in copies on the X chromosome. So uh, actually, you only have about 15, and by the way, there are debates about what a gene is, and when you reconsider what a gene is, you might come up with different numbers, but the basic analysis still applies. There's only a small number of male-specific genes on the Y chromosome, and furthermore, there's been lots of good functional analysis of these genes on the Y. Many of these genes are so-called pseudogenes, mean, meaning that they are uh, repetitive and sometimes non-coding. Many of the genes are duplicates, as I said, and these genes have been functionally found to express almost exclusively in the testes. That is, they are not involved in global sex differences, but in what we would expect, the most sex differentiated organ of the human body, which are the gonads. All right, so that's the Y chromosome one, but what about this 200 to 300 genes? Here's a direct quote. It's not just a little variation. This is 200 to 300 genes that are expressed up to twice as much as in a male. This is a huge number. So here's the driving interpretation of this result. Well, what about this finding? Well, we have the benefit of hindsight, which is a sneaky little trick here, right? Um, but uh, other studies unanimously have not find anything, found anything close to the 200 to 300. So 36 genes in one study, only nine genes. That is, it's not 200 to 300 genes on the X chromosome that are escaping in activation, but some nine or 36 genes, perhaps. Um, and that has held up over time. So why is there this huge discrepancy? Why did they, in their first study, come up with 200 to 300 genes? Well, their assumptions skewed their results. First of all, um, we saw that they failed to subtract out the many escapee genes on the X that have copies on the Y. Second of all, researchers assumed um, that escapee genes represent an extra gene in females. So genes might escape from inactivation on the second X chromosome, but it may not be that they express very much at all, even though they're escaping. Um, but in their reasoning, and in, we can see in their language, they almost started counting these as extra genes in the, in the human female, double the gene dosage. By the way, the findings on those genes, 9, 36, 200, or 300, have found very, very low levels of expression of those escapee genes. The functional importance of that, when we need to talk about log rhythmic differences in gene expression to talk functionality um, is really in question. Um, also, the researchers looked at sex difference alone, failing to consider obviously obvious interacting factors in vivo. So the studies that found 9 and 36 were, were in vivo studies. Um, so they looked at hormones, age, nutrition, tissue specificity. So these also repress, they work to repress and equalize gene expression between males and females. And finally, uh, researchers assumed that the X escapees will play a role in global differences between males and females, failing to note that all the good functional data that we have shows they're pretty much exclusive to the gonads. There are several other points I could include in there, um, but, the, but the main gist of this is, I think we have a really good case here of here you've got some cool data and bang, big, big claim about sex differences. Good example of how uh, claims about sex differences play a role in ac the actual cognitive reasoning, the inference making, the claims making in genomic research. Look, there are not nearly as many genes different between males and females as originally estimated. And these escapee genes uh, are likely to be of limited value for explaining the global sex differences that they claim interests them. So I, I think this is probably a good case of evidence of skewing. I could have given you lots of historical cases, but I wanted to give you one from our current moment, um, and one from credible researchers who cannot be accused of being kind of not you know, like bad actors in the field, but kind of good people doing good work, but nonetheless, they've fallen into this trap. Um, I think that this is actually really dangerous, and we need to have a big conversation about how we're conceptualizing sex differences as we enter the genomic and post-genomic age. 
thinking of the sexes as having different genomes is making a very, very strong claim. It's suggesting that there are systematic and law-like differences between male and female human genomes. And it exaggerates the amount of differences between the, se the sexes. Um, and it, it plays into a traditional gender ideological view of sex differences. So if I have a little bit of time left, um, I'll talk about a, another recent example of this uh, that I wrote about in Slate. Um, here's an example from just this spring. New York Times article, uh, researchers see new importance for the Y chromosome. And I think this offers perhaps a, an even more stunning allegory for our age about the way scientific hype and a fascination with the sex binary continues to influence scientific research on sex today. So what happened was two Nature articles came out on the Y chromosome, and they garnered extensive media attention. Does anyone remember reading about this? A few people, maybe? OK, well, I'll tell you all about it. Um, the study investigated the evolutionary history of 12 genes on the Y chromosome. So again, males have one X chromosome, uh, one X chromosome while females have two. The studies found that these 12 genes are present on the X chromosome. So they also need to be on the Y chromosome. So they're trying to understand why are these 12 genes here? Why do they remain on the Y chromosome? Um, and the study showed it's because they're also present on the X. It's that subset of genes I was telling you about that remain on both chromosomes because of their evolutionary history. OK, so why do they remain? Uh, this study showed that it's probably because those 12 genes play an all-purpose regulatory role in the human genome. So evolution can't get rid of them off that shrinking Y chromosome because they're necessary for all sorts of processes across the human body that are not sex-specific. Um, and it's, these genes are also present on the X. So the story goes, they need to be on the Y to ensure, once again, similar dosage of the gene product for men and for women. OK. So the studies uh, demonstrated, for example, that fetal viability is impaired without the func proper functioning of both sets of these genes. If you're a male, you need them on both your X and your Y. And if you're a female, you have them on your X and escaping from an activation on your second X. But here's what the interpretation, how the interpretation of the study was spun. The lead author of the study was quoted as saying that these, quote, special genes may play a large role in differences between males and females, um, and asserted that differences in disease rates may result from differences in men's and women's bodies, differences found as deep down as the cellular level. So how did a study that shows gene dosage equalization between males and females for genes on the sex chromosomes get spun as a new finding of dramatic sex differences. So the study presented the unsexy claim that certain genes on the Y chromosome work to actually ensure sexual similarity for those genes, um, and then filtered through our gendered scripts and scientific hype they became a revolutionary new finding said to have groundbreaking implications for our understanding of the genetic basis of sex differences. So I, I just, I had to get to work and I wrote a little, uh, little piece on this phenomenon. And I just think if you're teaching or you're thinking about these issues, it's a great recent case study of how this happens. Literally, the studying was a finding of similarity and somehow it got contorted into a finding of difference. OK, let's return to the lesson here, contextual values. Values in the context in which we all live and work in and around science. It isn't that, culture, that science impacts culture or culture impacts science, but they're all together. Science is a part of culture. And um, they contribute substantive background assumptions to scientific reasoning. We're not just talking about science having a possible harm for women or for men. We're talking about gender in the cognitive work of scientific research. OK, so when we're posed with questions like, do males and females have different genomes? Or 
we can compare male, can we compare males and females as we compare humans and chimpanzees? We're posed with claims that are not of the nature that they can be answered by a set of facts. We actually have to bring in assumptions in order to say yes or no to these kinds of questions. You could be like me and be someone who is who believes that uh, a more productive model for studying sex and gender in the genome is one that I call a dynamic dyadic model. Um, it's more reflective of the evolutionary history of the genome that passes through male bodies and female bodies into female bodies and male bodies, um, sex as co-evolved. Uh, or you can have this really, really dynamic sorry, binary notion of sex in which there's a male genome and a female genome and you might as well be looking at different species. So substantive assumptions, my assumptions, their assumptions. All of us are coming to the table with assumptions in order to answer some sort of study like this. So ultimately I want to convince you, first of all, yeah, cultural conceptions can play a role in the actual reasoning of science. They can play a positive role. They can play a destructive role. The main thing is that we're open and clear and making visible how those assumptions are working in our work. Um, and ultimately, I argue also that this new era of sex research calls for a mode of continuous critical engagement. We can use history to, use, to do this, cultural studies of gender, an understanding of how gender conceptions work within science um, in order to think really critically about this moment in which we're shifting from an endocrinological model of sex differences to a gene-based or genome-based model of sex differences. Unfortunately, it, as I argue in my book and, and document in some detail, it does seem that at this very moment, unfortunately, there's a lot of fallback on this essentialist binary model. But here's an enormous moment for intervention. The genome actually, it just, it, it, there's, we should let it take some time and let, uh, let it challenge our views of the, the binary between the sexes. So I think that happily there is a moment that, uh, in which all of us, in which gender scholars in fact can offer some insight um, into our re rethinking of sex in a genomic age. Okay, thank you. <laughs>